You can review content from Crash Course Anatomy and Physiology with the Crash Course app, available now for Android and iOS devices. Hello, everybody. I think that we have begun the live stream now. I'm Hank Green. This is Office Hours. I'm the host, was once the host of Crash Course Anatomy and Physiology. And for the next hour, we're going to be answering your questions about a and to maybe help you study for finals or whatever you're up to. And I'm joined by a person who actually knows uh, stuff about anatomy and physiology. Our script, our, our, our consultant on that, that project who helped us make sure we got everything right. It's Brandon. Hello, Brandon Jackson. Hi, Hank. Uh, Brandon, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do. Uh, I'm now an associate professor at Longwood University. Uh, I've been here for about seven years. I used to live in Missoula where we first met. And, uh, you know, I've taught, I was thinking about it, I've taught anatomy and physiology or comparative anatomy for almost 18 years now. So it's been quite a ride. That's great. Well, you're the right person to have here. Uh, here's how I was going to go. We've got people to send in their questions um, ahead of time. So we've got some prepared that we know we're going to do. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about some study tips for specifically how to study for anatomy and physiology, which I found very helpful learning about from Brandon. And then we're going to end with some questions from the chat. So if you have any, put them in there. Appreciate all of you for doing that. Before we get to your questions, I want to talk a little bit about our partner for Office Hours. We're very lucky to have a partner. It's uh, Flipgrid, which is a free video discussion app from Microsoft, and they got a mission to make learning fun and empowering for all. It's been used in the classroom for nearly a decade, and as we talk about preparing for uh, exams, Flipgrid is a convenient way to host study groups without having to coordinate around a class schedule or after school commitments. You can create a group, start a topic, and send the link to anyone you want to join. Uh, you can record video or audio responses, discuss specific concepts in detail, quiz each other, prep for group presentations, all of that. We hear from Crash Course viewers all the time how helpful video is as a learning tool. It's one of the reasons we made Crash Course and connecting with peers and learning in groups with your peers in a community is a wonderful thing. We used Flipgrid to collect some of the questions that we're going to be asking on the live stream. So let's start with some questions for the live stream. Brandon, are you ready? Do you know enough about anatomy and physiology to answer these questions? I, I will do my best. I'm pretty sure you do. <laughs> this first one comes from Dhruv who asks, is the heart a muscle or an organ? It's great yeah. because now we get to talk about muscles, organs, tissues, cells. Exactly, this, this is a really interesting question. It seems kind of simple at first and uh, it's not just a yes or no answer. This is gonna be kind of a long-winded answer. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, I think, because <laughs> it's kind of cool. Uh, so, But really we have to get down to definitions and the hierarchy of organization that we talk about in anatomy and physiology and, and most of biology really, right? So we can take atoms and make molecules. We can take molecules and if we arrange them in just the right way, we get cells. Uh, if we take a bunch of cells that all look alike and are and, and function together and organize them in the right way in a body, that's what we call a tissue. And this is where we kind of start. Now, if we take multiple tissues and combine them together and we get a thing in the body, a structure in the body that has more or less a single function or sometimes mm -hmm. multiple functions, that's an organ. So an organ has multiple tissues and at least an obvious one obvious function. Now, this, see... This is what confuses, I, I think this is what confused me about this, and maybe what is confusing Drew about this, is that um, I hear that uh, that muscle is a tissue type. Yes. But a muscle Correct. is not a tissue type? That You got it. You got it. <laughs> so mu muscle is a tissue type. It's one of four tissue types. So we have epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue. I mean, I and, love that there's only four. That's way easier than almost everything. But we did, I, how many episodes did we do on tissue? I, I think we did yeah. two on just connective tissue because yeah. there's, yeah. I don't know, you know, A 14 lot. kinds of whatever, uh, I'm not counting here. So, right, so of muscle tissue, there's actually three kinds of muscle tissue. And you can tell the difference if you look just down at the cellular level. And, and then there's some other functional differences. But really the ones we're talking about here, there's two. There's skeletal muscle tissue, and that's the muscle the tissue you find in your favorite skeletal muscle. Hank, what's your favorite skeletal muscle? My favorite skeletal muscle has got to yeah. be the, the butt, right? Okay, so the gluteus maximus. Thanks. That one? Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll call it the gluteus maximus. There's a medius too. There's some other muscles in there, but okay, so the gluteus maximus. Now that is a skeletal muscle that has skeletal muscle tissue in it, uh, as opposed to the heart, which has cardiac muscle tissue in it. So there's yeah. th 
there, there's our multiple muscle tissue types. Um, now, are they an organ? And this is kind of the other part of the question. So let's take the gluteus maximus first. And is that an organ? It, it actually is, because remember the definition yeah. of an organ is multiple tissue type. So we have the skeletal muscle tissue in there. Yeah. And that's that's the bulk of it. That's the thing that does like the work. Does the right? work, that, but you can't yeah. do the work. Let me let me see if I can name a couple others. I okay. can feel my butt, so it's got nervous tissue in it. Yep. And my butt is alive, so it's got it's gotta have some vasculature. There's gotta be some delivery of oxygen. So it's got veins and stuff. So it's got veins and stuff. So arteries and veins going through there. And those are actually lined with simple squamous epithelial tissue called so endothelial epithelial tissue. Okay. So that's their, your epithelial. So we actually have all four tissue types in the in muscle. There. We didn't talk oh, yeah. about, con yeah, we didn't talk oh, yeah. about connective tissue in there, but you have the tendons and ligament or the tendons connected to the end. That's connective tissue, dense, regular connective tissue. And then kind of through the rest of the muscle, we have all these different layers like the epimyceum and the paramyceum. And those are also connective tissue. So right. there's your organ, all four tissue types. It's it's kind of an overachiever of an organ. <laughs> and, and yet we but don't you don't yeah, you know, you don't really think of it that way. Cause I'm like, yeah, a liver is an organ. When I, I can like right. take it out and hold it in my hand and be like, that looks like an organ. But right. So now you say how many organs do you have in your body? And now you have to add in all the muscles on top of you know yeah. the, the the things you usually think about as an organ. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's skeletal muscle. But what about cardiac muscle? Same thing out of the tissue types. Yeah. What we have, the cardio muscle cells are, that's the cardiac muscle tissue. So that's one. We also have epithelium. The inside of the heart is the endocardium. The outside of the heart is the um, epicardium. Those are both epithelial tissues. So there's two. Uh, and then there's uh, other forms of connective tissue in and around it. There's fat tissue around it. That's connective. The valves inside of the heart are a type oh, of yeah. connective tissue. Yeah, they, so, they, I've never touched one, but I've seen them, and they look like they're just the like, like cartilage almost. The, the valves, yeah, they're yeah. they're uh, yeah, they're kind of leathery, I guess you could oh. you could say. Um, <laughs> so they are. Uh, so there, there we have multiple tissue types. An obvious function, like pumping the blood. Uh, there we go. It's an organ. Doesn't so here's the question: right. Is it a muscle? Uh, it's a muscle. It's, it's muscle my answer. <laughs> it's my answer for you. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Right. So, so you know, in, in, in anatomy and physiology, we have uh, very specific language. So we don't just say a muscle, we say a skeletal muscle. So mm. if, is it a skeletal muscle? No. no. Is it muscular? Is it a muscle in kind of common day, everyday language? Sure, it's a muscle, uh, but definitely it's an organ. And skeletal muscles are also organs. Skeletal muscles or organs, uh, just blowing everybody's minds. Okay, yeah. got another question for you. It's from Maggie. This one came in from Flipgrid and Maggie asks, I'm in my first year of college, my first year taking anatomy. I had a question about skin cells. How are they organized throughout the layers of the skin? So it's, she goes on to talk about a bunch of different types of, of skin cells and are they like spread out? So they've got melanocytes and you got keratinocytes, uh, Langerhans cells, which are, I think, immune cells. Am I wrong yep. about that? Okay. No, that's correct. Um, yep. Good. Uh, and, and so they're in the skin. Are they like peppered throughout? Are they in layers as the like skin sort of cause skin, like, like it sort of builds up at the bottom and then like pushes higher Do do these things like move up with it or do they stay in the same place? How are they doing this? What are they doing? Yeah. So they're, we, we have some, some of these cells are related to each other and some aren't. Um, and so we can start with that. And actually the, the idea of the tissues will come back into play here. So the, the main cell that we talk about with the epidermis at least are the keratinocytes. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the, what make the keratin that make your skin kind of dry and tough and yeah. Yeah, they do the it, job impermeable. of skin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so these are formed in the stratum basale. It's the deepest layer of the epidermis and uh, that's where the new ones are formed from a layer, a thin layer of stem cells. So the stem cell divides, it creates one keratinocyte, and then the other one is still going to stay down there as the stem cell. Mm -hmm. And so that keratinocyte then gets kind of pushed higher and higher um, as new younger ones are made behind it. And I mean, it's kind of dark to think about this, but these skin cells are almost like us as we age. Uh, right, we start off young and plump and and happy and healthy, and then as we age, you know, we we start getting some spots and that's get harder. 
yeah, just it's the life granulosa. happens. You get wrinkly. That's the stratum spinosum. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you get beat up, withered, dried up. You end up a literally a shell of your former self. And at yeah. that point, if you're a keratinocyte, at least you're dead. And you're just the keratin and wax that you kind right. of aged with. And then you're in the stratum corneum, the, the top layer. Um, eventually, you get pushed off and lost as dust, basically. Yes, which okay. is all of our eventual fates. Right. Just lost that, as yeah. dust. Just Beautiful. lost as dust. Yeah. So, OK, so let's uh, maybe it's a very dark analogy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the so that's the that one cell. Once you're a keratinocyte, once you're born kind of born as a keratinocyte, you're always a keratinocyte. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have these other cells, the melanocytes. These are the cells that uh, provide the, the various hues of brown to to our skins. Mm -hmm. And uh, melanocytes are actually related to the keratinocytes. So the keratinocytes are an epithelial cell, a uh, stratified squamous epithelial cell, and the melanocytes are also epithelial they are kind of distant cousins of the keratinocytes. Uh, so the melanocytes come from a different stem cell, but the keratinocyte stem cell and the melanocyte stem cell come from the same stem cell. It's like a, it's like a taxonomic tree happening here, but just yeah, our body cells. Yeah. It, it's like cousins, right? They share a grandfather or grandparents, yeah. something uh -huh. like that. Um, <laughs> And so the melanocytes, uh, that stem cell is usually found near hair follicles, but then the melanocyte kind of migrates through, mm. sets up shop in the lower levels of the keratinocytes and, and with the younger ones, and uh, creates melanin and then kind of distributes that melanin mm. further up in the skin. And, so and like they can be much never, longer lived. It never moves up. It just sort of like hangs out there and they move past it. Correct, correct. The cells kind of move past and pick up these um, melanin granules uh, uh, and, and carry them up and then yeah. lose them eventually. Yeah. Uh, let's see, where were we? So then that's the melanocyte. That's kind of a cousin, still epithelial. And then we had the Langerhans cell. And the Langerhans, like you said, is an is a immune cell. And so the immune cells are uh, actually... Uh, bl essentially blood cells, right? What right. we've heard of white blood Total, cells. Or totally leukocytes. different cell lineage, not the same stem cells. Totally cells different. Here. That's connective tissue. Blood blood is actually connective tissue. And you these say form this, it will never brain. make sense to me. It's what's blood connect? We don't have to talk about it. E everything? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's... Uh, I don't it, think it it's actually... what they meant when they originally came up with the term connective tissue that connects skeletal stuff together. But hey. It, it is kind of a grab -all. There's some embryology that supports blood in this group, and we won't get into that right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these are immune cells. They're actually monocytes. Uh, one of the five white blood cells or leukocytes that are floating around in your body. These are monocytes, and monocytes are famous for crawling out into different parts of the body. And depending on where they are, we give them a different name. But really, they always become a macrophage. Uh, so it, these Langerhans cells are also called dendritic cells because they have lots of branches, and and dendrite means branches. And but really, they are a macrophage. So macrophage is like a, this right. big functional white, white description. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they're the they're the big thing that goes out and gobbles up all of the bacteria that are trying to get through <laughs> your skin. Yeah, that's big what they're doing there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and they're free floating. Uh, they they're not attached, so they can move around a little bit. Mostly, really found down in the in the dermis, in the top of the dermis, right underneath the epidermis. Uh, but they can be found elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so they're they're staying there. They're not moving up with everything. No, nope, so they're it's, also it's not getting like pushed it's up. just it's there's like the conveyor belt of keratinocytes, but nothing else goes up the conveyor belt. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the last one are the, the Merkel discs or the Merkel cells. Yeah. And they're, they're really nervous function. Uh, they're, they're part of our sensory system. They're part of how we sense touch uh, and one of the types of touch. Uh, and they, as far as I can tell, we don't actually know exactly what they come from uh, in terms of their, their stem cell lineage. Um, mm -hmm. They function with the nervous system. They some people say from what I've read that they say that they come from skin cells or they say that they come from the nervous system. It's actually kind of cool because both the skin and the nervous system come from the ectoderm embryologically. Uh, so they're at least distant, distant cousins in that manner. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So they're all they're all friends and they hang out together, but only there's only one conveyor belt and it's correct. Yes. Um, all right, we have another question. We've got a bunch of people who asked questions about uh, 
uh, the nervous system and gated channels and action potentials, um, Kit and Diana yeah. and Ali and Alan and Wazi. Uh, so can you tell me just in general <laughs> about ion channels, I guess, and action yeah. potentials? You, you know, this is about maybe two chapters in a, even an introductory book. Uh, so yeah. It, but it's it's actually really interesting because if you get down the basics, and I'll try to boil this down to just a few rules here, but if you can get the basics down, you actually learn about not just how neurons work, but also how the heart works, how skeletal muscle works. Um, there's probably something else that uses the these action potentials that I can't think of well, right I now. Well, I mean, any any sensing. Exactly. All of our senses, our eyes, our ears. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So very, and this is also a very common stumbling block for students. A lot of people have trouble when they're starting out learning this. So I like to teach this with, boil down to just a few pretty simple rules. Um, it's oversimplifying a little bit, uh, but if you get these down, then you can add on the other layers uh, that, that really help you get into all the details. Okay, so first rule, there are more sodium cells, or sorry, sodium ions outside of these cells than inside. Mm -hmm. And there's more potassium inside than outside. And the cell is making that happen. The cell is making that happen with a, a pump called the mm -hmm. sodium potassium pump. So, so good pumping name for potassium it. in, sodium out. Correct. So rule one, sodium's out, potassium's in. Uh, and both of them are positive ions, if you don't know that. Okay, now these kinds of ions, we, when they're dissolved in water, we call them solutes. And generally, solutes want to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Mm -hmm. okay. In other words, given the opportunity, sodium wants to come into the cell because it's outside, and potassium wants to get out of the cell because it's inside. We got that, Hank? We got that. Okay. Rule three. Uh, ignore, don't worry too much yet about exactly how we got here. But if we were to measure the electrical difference, remember these are electrically charged, they're both positive. If we were to measure the electricity inside of the cell compared to the outside, it would show up at about negative 70. And depending on the book, sometimes it's listed as negative 65, negative 70, <laughs> close okay. enough. Yeah, yeah it's close uh, enough. Significant figures. Uh, it, but why is there an electrical charge if they're both positive charged? Oh, okay, so you want to you want to ask about this. so? Well, let's see. It seems like a logical question to it, ask. It is. So, so one reason is that inside of the cell there are large anionic or negatively charged proteins. So there's some stuff inside of the cell that has a negative charge that can't leave the cell. Um, the there's another reason that has to do with potassium trying to get out and actually being allowed out a little bit down its gradient mm -hmm. and negative 70 is the balancing voltage to prevent more from leaving. They, um, yeah, the, the cell figured it out. The cell made it yeah. so that there's negative 70 milliwatts or whatever. Right. But okay. the, and, and this is the trick. If the book t tries to get you to see why it's negative 70, leave that for later. Okay. It, <laughs> just... <laughs> you, you'll get it later. It's so much easier if you leave that for that. Yeah, yeah. After we talk about all the movement. Okay, so we have negative 70. Um, and then you often see these graphs of action potentials where uh, you'll see a line, the voltage starting at negative 70, and then it's going to go up or down or something like that. So it always will start at negative 70 or negative 65. Uh, and that is, again, always telling you the inside of the cell relative to the outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last rule is actually a result of all of those other rules. And so here's, Hank, where I'm gonna ask you to answer this. If the inside of, is negative 70 and mm -hmm. sodium is allowed to come into the cell and sodium's positively charged, <laughs> what happens to the voltage? Does it go up or down? Goes Does up. it get more positive or, yeah, it goes up. It, gets, it becomes more positive yeah. or less negative. Less negative. It, yeah. yeah. Right. So we're adding positives to the inside if sodium comes in. Now, what happens if potassium is allowed to leave? Then it gets more negative. More negative. It goes down. Okay. There's, that's all the math you really need for this. Okay. Love that. Okay, Up so, and down. Yeah, it's not math. Sodium, it's just a direction. Right, right. So sodium, <laughs> sodium comes in and the line goes up, sodium goes out, or potassium goes out, the voltage goes down. Right. There are your rules. If you get those, 
then the rest is literally just like opening and closing doors. This and is how, every, put, this is how everything stores. works. And yeah. there's a bunch of different doors that let the different things in and out in different ways. Right. So really, we can talk about four kinds of doors. And for right now, we'll skip the first two. I'll just mention them. One is called a leakage channel. So these are protein just, channels. Just a door. It's just a, yeah, it's an open door. Uh, yeah. These are protein channels across the cell membrane. They're specific. They only let either sodium or potassium through. Uh, and so those things are going to go the direction that they want to go. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the leakage channels are just always open. The other one that is part of how we sense touch and hear and balance is called a mechanically gated channel. Basically, it opens if the cell membrane gets stretched like the, the door gets stretched open. It's, so it's, a phys it's actually a physical reaction. So when we are feeling touch, we are feeling touch. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. So then we have two other channels and they're important for really what this question is getting out of how neurons work. One is called a chemically gated channel or a ligand gated channel. channel. And the, a ligand is just something that binds to a protein. Yeah. Yeah. This is a key in a lock kind of situation. So here's a door, it's closed, it's locked. We need a key to open it. That key is usually going to be something like acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. It's actually the neurotransmitter that helps uh, trigger your, your muscles to contract. Okay, so acetylcholine, if it binds to that little protein, it's the key, it unlocks the door. The one we usually talk about with these ligand gated channels are sodium channels. So let's say we open a sodium channel. What happens to sodium? Which direction does it go? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> so, sodium's outside and it wants to come in let's come in okay yep it wants to come in and so then the sodium right now, now the inside since we're adding positives the inside is going to get more yep. positive and the yep. voltage is going to start to go up yeah now, we could we should have we should have just renamed these molecules these, these ions we should have called it uh, one of them the out ion and one of them the in ion and that would have simplified things greatly well and the abbreviation for sodium is na and the abbreviation for potassium is k so we so, picked the the hardest to remember ones. I know, I know exactly. It's like mercury is a little bit harder than those, but basically yep. everything else. <laughs> I, I'm I'm glad I'm not responsible for the naming convention. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so let's see. So we have these uh, these key channels. We can open sodium ones. We can open potassium ones. Now the next ones are the important part for how the action potential actually travels. So the whole idea of this is to get a signal to go from point A like your brain to point B like your gluteus maximus muscle <laughs> and to get it to contract. Now that's a long way to, for it to travel. And so we want it to travel fairly quickly so that we can react to proper things uh, like walking. You know, it's important <laughs> to time things well when yeah. we're walking. Uh -huh. And that's what these, these, this next channel is called voltage gated channels. And they open when that voltage inside of the cell reaches a certain level. And just in that one location where that cell is. So they open at about negative 55 millivolts. Um, we call this the threshold voltage for these channels. Mm -hmm. So we started at negative 70, but we bring in some sodium and then mm. the line starts to go up. If that, if that cell reaches about negative 55, the voltage gated channels will open. And the first ones that open are the sodium channels. Did you have a question, Hank? No, I was just imagining them expanding. Yeah, so they, they, they open up, sodium starts coming in, now these voltage-gated channels. And as the sodium comes in, it starts to like crawl along the inside of the membrane. It kind of floats in and then distributes. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to slide its way down to uh, a little bit further on down the cell. Eventually, it will find another voltage-gated sodium channel. Mm -hmm. And if enough sodiums are on the inside, it raises the voltage at that point, opens that door, sodium rushes in, slides down, next gate, Cascade. Sodium in, slides down. And now we get this wave of sodium rushing in all the way down the cell. In a fraction of a second, it can go a meter down your leg. Ooh, so cool. very fast reaction. And this is why I like salt. But this is why salt and sodium levels is very important. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, if you get you too much sure or too little, yeah. too little sodium, you get like tingles and dizziness because your, mm -hmm. your muscles and your uh, neurons can start to malfunction. Um, now, when that gets all the way down to the end of the neuron, it does something else. It actually opens a voltage-gated calcium channel, and calcium is just the final signal that releases, tells the cell to release its neurotransmitters. Mm. Uh, now, the whole time that this has been happening, there's actually another channel, another voltage-gated channel. We, we kind of ignored potassium to this point, right? 
And so the sodium at that threshold voltage that was opening the voltage gated sodium channels was also opening voltage gated potassium channels, but they are sticky doors. They don't open that quickly. So actually by, you know, they're like mm. big, thick, creepy, creaky doors. They're slowly opening. Sodium's rushing in its channel. And by the time sodium's pretty much done rushing in, potassium wants to rush out. And so they, they're just offset enough. So as the sodium rushes in, the voltage goes up. And right at the top, at about positive 30, then the potassium channels start to open. And then when the potassium channels open, potassium is leaving. So what happens if we take a bunch of positive things from inside and we let them out? What happens to the inside? Does it get more positive or more negative if we remove positives? I was looking at the slack. I wasn't paying attention to you. That's yeah, okay. I had to check gets, on something. It gets more <laughs> negative. <laughs> uh, it's okay. My students text in class sometimes. Right. So I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so, so the inside of the cell is going to get more negative uh, if those positive, I, uh, positive potassiums are leaving. And okay. it actually is going to get so negative that we reset the, the voltage. So now we've sent the signal and we've reset it. And you know, there, again, there's a little bit more to it than that. But if you can mm -hmm. get that part down and those rules that we started with, then um, you can layer on the rest of your understanding on that. Right, right, right. Amazing. I mean, and this is all like, the, the, the great thing about understanding that stuff is that like, from now on and forever, you, you just have a totally different understanding of how your body interacts with the, the world around it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Number nine uh, is the, the question that this is on my list, but not the number that we're on. Uh, just, <laughs> it's from Laurel who asks, what is the best way to uh, to remember the names and locations of the bone landmarks? I don't even know what bone landmark was a thing. Uh, but in no. general, there's a lot of memorization in anatomy and physiology. I like the part where it's conceptual. I don't like the part where um, I'm memorizing bones. You know, for for my students, I try to tell them don't memorize, memorize or memorize as little as possible. Yeah. And the way to do that is to find what's common between all of the different all the different things. So for example, with the, the thing we just talked about, if you know a few rules of how these channels work and how cells are set up, you know how nerves work, how muscles work and how a bunch of our senses work. Mm -hmm. So find those commonalities. Now, bones are, are kind of two parts. One is the, the structural part and the other part of learning them is learning the words. And we're, I think we're gonna talk about how to learn all the words later. Yeah, we'll get there too. Um, but as far as the bones, they're, you know, they're a really physical thing. And so I think the best way to learn a lot of these details is really just to draw it out yourself. It's great if you can, ha if you have a model, a plastic model in a lab, uh, or I mean, you can order, you know, you have stand there behind you. Um, you can, you can get a skeleton, a full skeleton online <laughs> some places. Uh, there's 3D apps, but really... I, it's it's helpful to get your brain well, to process yeah. it in a this different is, way. This is well known that if that like they, like the more work you are doing with your fingers, yeah, uh, is the the better you are learning. So actually right. drawing, it, it, like looking at a thing and then closing it and then trying to draw it, that is how you, that is how you learn things. Right, and I'm going to suggest something uh, like what you just said that. It's really drawing, trying to draw it from memory. Now, you, you take a femur or something like that. There's a whole bunch of little bumps and things on it. And of course, it's three-dimensional, which is hard to draw on paper. Mm -hmm. so, so you do your best. And I suggest starting with just the very basic shape. Don't even worry about all the bumps the first time you draw it. Look at the book, study it, get an idea for the shape, and then draw it. And, and this is where, if you're a horrible artist like me, my dad's an artist. I didn't get those genes. And if you're a, hor if you're a horrible artist like me, it's actually good because you don't worry about getting all the little details in the shading, just get the basic shape. Mm -hmm. Draw that and label whatever you can. Then go back to your book or go back to whatever kind of reference you're working on and see where you could improve or see if you got everything right, see if you could add one more detail or add one more label. Right. And then close the resource, draw it again, all you, only looking at your previous drawing. So make it a little bit better, do it all again, label what you can, and then compare it to the resource and just kind of go back and forth and slowly build up your knowledge that way. 
if your teacher, uh, like, <laughs> like I do to my students, I'll hand them a list of like 300 terms to know in a lab. And that's totally overwhelming. Don't study the whole thing all at once, one yeah. thing at a time, or maybe two things at a time. Mm -hmm. And so drawing is really good for that. Totally. Um, all right, we got a question that uh, is from a bunch of people, uh, Gracie, Jamila, Ryan, uh, who asks that there's, it's all just generally about heart function and ECGs and how ECGs work. Yeah, uh, this is the other common stumbling block, the nervous system and then the, the, this heart function. Um, we have to sort of understand the whole cascade of heart cells and what they're doing. Yeah, well, we actually already know some of that. So there's there's really two parts to understanding heart function. One is electrical, and we mostly just talked about that. Well, we can talk a little bit more about that. And the other is really like physical. Um, and this is when we what talk about- What like, happens in what order? Yeah, and like pumping the blood, the, the pressure and stuff that is involved in, in moving the blood through the body. Uh, mm -hmm. So here, here's a rule. And, and this is, again, mostly accurate. Uh, some physicists may not- think that I'm phrasing this <laughs> properly, but for the purposes of anatomy and physiology, this is what you need to know. Fluids move from high pressure to low pressure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it, that's yeah. pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. So, yep. and this is fluids, including air and uh, liquids like blood. So actually this tells us how we breathe, how we, how we move air in and out of our lungs. It's high pressure and low pressure. Okay. But, but back to the heart. Um, so what is the heart? The heart is a muscle, right? That's kind of where we started. And so muscles contract. And when the heart contracts, it produces pressure inside of the heart. Um, and th this is, so this is how the, the blood is going to get moved around, but it's important that the heart is not all contracting at all at once. Like your gluteus maximus might contract when you're running, right? It's the heart actually contracts in kind of two parts. So the top part of the heart is they're called the atria. So you have a left atrium and a right atrium. And then in the bottom half of the heart, you have the ventricles, a left ventricle and a right ventricle. And the blood goes from atria on one side to ventricles on the same side. So what we want to have happen is the atria to contract on top to send the rest of the blood down to the ventricles. And then once the ventricles are fully filled up, then we want them to contract. We don't want them contracting at the same time as the atrium. Mm -hmm. So there's this little delay in there. Um, that delay is actually part of the electrical system. So uh, let's, we'll, again, we'll come back to that electrical system. So just kind of ignore the delay for right now. So the atria, they're going to squeeze and create higher pressure than higher fluid pressure or hydro, uh, hydrostatic pressure than what we find in the ventricle. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have a pressure gradient and the blood will flow from atria down to ventricles. When the atria are done squeezing, then the big ventricles are gonna squeeze at the bottom and they can produce a lot of pressure. And so they start squeezing. As the pressure in the ventricles gets above the pressure in the atria, then the blood will want to flow to that low pressure in the atrium. Uh, and it will actually start to flow that direction, but then it gets stuck on those valves that we were talking about earlier, that kind of leathery, tough connective tissue. And it'll shut those valves. It'll, it'll, the backflow will, will actually close those valves and they slam shut. And that kind of slamming shut and this pressure wave that happens is the first heartbeat sound that you hear, right? So we talk about the, the lub dub of heartbeat mm -hmm. sounds, the two sounds. This is the lub, this is the first one. Then the ventricle keeps contracting and keeps building up pressure. I mean, this all happens in a fraction of a second. So I'm kind of slowing this way down. So the, as the pressure builds in the ventricle, it eventually gets high enough that it's higher than the pressure out in the big arteries like the aorta. Uh, so the aorta at rest, when the, when the heart's at rest, is about 80 millimeters of mercury. Uh, mercury is abbreviated HG. There's your other favorite one. <laughs> and so the, the uh, and that's your, your resting blood pressure, your, what we call your diastolic blood pressure. So it's the, if you have 120 over 80 for your blood pressure, that's that bottom number. So the ventricle is going to eventually get higher pressure than the pressure in the aorta. At that point, now we have a pressure gradient again, and the blood is going to want to flow from the high pressure in the ventricle to the lower pressure in the aorta. So then it will start, it'll actually open a valve called the semilunar valve and will push out into the aorta. But at some point, the ventricle has squeezed out almost all of its blood. And so it can't keep up that pressure anymore. And the pressure in the ventricle will start to drop. 
but there's still a lot of pressure up in the aorta. And so once we get that reverse pressure gradient again, the blood will try to flow from the higher pressure in the ventricle or in the uh, aorta back mm -hmm. into the ventricle. And that little backflow will slam shut the semilunar valves. And that's the second sound that we hear. Uh, so it's all about pressure differentials. And this actually brings us to one of my favorite anatomy facts of all of anatomy and physiology, right? So think about the word circulatory system. It means circle, right? So the, the blood is traveling in a circle mm -hmm. from the heart back to the heart. But if the heart is both the start and the end and fluid flows from high pressure to low pressure, it means the heart is both the highest pressure and the lowest pressure just at different times. Yeah, and not just that, but like a big differential because it has to push it through all those tissues. Like, yeah, like so that the tight spaces. That, yeah, so that that ventricle can develop 120 millimeters of mercury of pressure, uh, and up in the aorta, and it carries down your arm. So when you get your blood pressure cuff put on mm -hmm. your arm, that's where it's measuring. That's kind of basically getting that same pressure from the from the heart, and then the the atria and the ventricle they have to drop all the way back down to essentially a pressure of zero in order to receive the blood all the way back around the other side. Well, a physicist will argue about a pressure of zero. True, uh, and, and this is all <laughs> relative pressures kind of too. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. we're all under, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, um, and the other, like the thing that I also remember is that like that the, the the work to fill up the lung with blood is also just a huge amount of pressure necessary for that just because there's so much to fill it with blood or with air with blood yeah but and it's but it's actually less pressure not because... filling the blood they're not filling with blood lung with blood filling all of the alveoli and stuff with filling blood. the the yeah the capillaries <laughs> with blood not the, yeah. yeah yeah uh yeah, it, it's actually far less pressure than okay. the other side. So the left ventricle develops about 120 millimeters of mercury, if mm. by the like, population average, 120 millimeters. Um, the right ventricle is more like 30 or 40 millimeters, and that's what's uh, pumping into the into the. That's what's pumping lungs. into the yeah. into the lungs. Part of that is the lungs have a very thin membrane between the blood capillaries and the air because we want the air to be able to mm -hmm. pass through that membrane. You don't pop those. You don't want to pop those with too high a blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, it's also a shorter distance, and there's some other reasons why there's lower yeah. pressure. But yeah, it's, it's a very delicate yeah. system. Wildly delicate system, and it works all of the time and never stops working ever, I promise. N never. <laughs> um, so I think we still had the uh, the electrical part of the heart. Oh, and God. I know. It's actually not that bad. The signal is exactly what we talked about before. It's these waves of voltage-gated channels, sodium channels opening and carrying the signal around the heart. Uh, it starts, it mostly starts in the, what we call the sinoatrial node, which is on the, up, uh, about the upper right corner of the heart. And it's a bunch of cells that they, they have actually leakage channels. We mentioned before, they have some leakage sodium channels. And so sodium is leaking in constantly and, and causing that voltage to creep up. And when the voltage heats hits uh, the threshold voltage, the massive signal goes all the way around all the atria and they contract and then reset. And then the sodium starts leaking in and the voltage creeps up again. And so that's the SA node has that, uh, right. that automatic timer. And that's why we call it the internal pacemaker. Right. So there isn't like a part of your brain, like some subconscious part of your brain that's like, okay, make sure you keep beating the heart. The heart beats itself. The heart beats itself. The brain through various mechanisms can can turn that faster or slower yeah. but yeah, the heart well, beats itself yeah. Yeah. for 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 when you need more oxygen cuz your right. um, your big big butt muscles are pushing you along right you get your fight or flight response and your butt <laughs> muscles have to push you along they need more oxygen heart rate's going to increase all right um, um well so we yeah so we have this electrical signal around the heart there's a little pause at the it can't get through those valves to the bottom to the ventricle so there's a little delay as it goes through the atrioventricular node and then the electrical signal gets dispersed from that and causes the ventricles to contract okay so it's the same signal that's causing the ventricles to contract too it so is there's just this it's always it's, linked it's it's like a fire hose through a pinhole it, it gets mm. stuck at this little thin little uh conduction area and then that 
allows for that delay so that the atria can contract and push their blood down in the ventricles before the ventricles contract and push the blood out. And it's a delicate system. And if anything goes wrong with it, that's why you have all kinds of different heartbeat all problems. All kinds of different heartbeat problems, correct. Yeah. Mm. That's pretty cool. Um, and I'm glad that it works. All right, Brandon, I want to ask you about some tri tips and tricks for learning about anatomy yes. and physiology. Um, first of all, with regards to learning these words. Yes, lots of words. Uh, like, like I said before, memorize as little as possible. And one way to do that is to learn the root words of things. Uh, there's a lot of Latin and Greek, it doesn't matter which one it is, uh, but learn things like epi, E-P-I. That mm -hmm. means upon or on top of, or you know, you can phrase it slightly different ways, but really it's that idea of like on or around. Mm -hmm. So learn that word epi and then go find in all of the systems, all of, or all the systems you're studying at that time, all the words that start with epi. Mm -hmm. So you have epidermis is on top of the dermis. Uh, you have epicardium is the epithelial layer on, upon the heart or around the heart. You have the, uh, you have epinephrine, which epi is on top of or upon, and nephrine means kidney. So you'll see words like nephron and stuff like that with kidneys. Mm -hmm. Well, epinephrine means on top of the kidneys. That's where the <laughs> adrenal glands are that actually make epinephrine, or we also call it and, adrenaline, depending yeah. on which side of the Atlantic Ocean you're on. So now we, none of us will ever forget where the adrenal gland is. Right. Like they're, they're. They're epi nephros. Ep epi, yeah. yeah, which I did never had occurred to me that epinephrine was at all related to even anatomy. I thought it was just like a chemical name. Right, right. So, so that that's there. You go. Now you'll never forget where it is, and now you know exactly what epi means, and you can figure out a lot of other words. That's kind of the fun thing if you know the words. Mm -hmm. Instead of memorizing, you get to figure out a, a, other things. Um, and then back to the bone question. Right. So how do you learn all the, the landmarks? Well, mm -hmm. a lot of the landmarks have these repeating names. So you have fossas and foramen and trochanters and grooves and a whole bunch of names like that that repeat over and over. So pick one like fossa. fossa a fossa is a shallow depression uh, in, in a bone, usually where a muscle attaches. And then go find all the fossas and figure out where they are and what they look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you put all these words together, suddenly some words start to make a lot more sense. So on the scapula, on your shoulder blade, there's a couple of large fossa. One of them is the infraspinous fossa of the scapula. And that might seem like a kind of intimidating word at first or set of words at first. Well, infra means below. Spinous refers to the spine that runs along the scapula, not your vertebra spine, but the spine on the scapula. And then fossa is a shallow depression. So the infraspinous fossa is the shallow depression that sits below the spine of the scapula. Once again, if you know those parts, mm -hmm. that word is, you know, is a lot easier to remember. And then you can picture exactly where it is. And right. even more helpful, the muscle that attaches there is called infraspinitis. Yeah. Which sounds <laughs> like a disease. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That, and now we'll never forget about the, yes, I will. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's not, not work, but this is a way to make it less work. And, and it, yeah, it makes it more fun. I think too. Yeah. Uh, yeah it hunting. gives you, it gives you tools instead of, yeah. yeah. Instead of just memorizing. Yeah. Um, all right. You got any other things, any other ways you, you <sighs> see working? Yeah. So a lot of my students tell me that they make flashcards and flashcards are great. Yeah. But I think you have to use them the correct way. And we've learned a lot. And there was the crash course study to, yeah. uh, study section, the whole course on that, that covers some of this. But one of the keys to using flashcards is to randomize them and also to figure out, use them to figure out what you know and what you don't know. And really mm -hmm. we should all work on our weaknesses at first. Uh, mm -hmm. It's easier to work on our strengths. We need to work on our weaknesses. So if you yeah. have flashcards, and I've had students come in with like a stack of 300 index cards, beautiful flashcards, artwork, all kinds of stuff on them. And they say, I'm studying them. I'm not learning anything. And I will show them what to do. I'll take the whole stack. Let's say these. this is all the bones and bone landmarks. 
And on one side, they have bones. And on the other side, they have landmarks or something like that. I take their whole stack of flashcards and I throw them up in the air as, hard, as high as I can in my office. <laughs> they scatter and they, they all flip over. And then we, we pick them up together. Now, the, the order has changed and they're, they're flipped in different directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part one. Now, that's already pretty good to just study from those. But really, you kind of have to put yourself in a testing situation. You have to use what's called recall practice. And the way to do that, I, one way I suggest doing that is to take maybe just the top 10 flashcards. Don't flip them over. Don't reorganize them exactly how you picked them up. Take the top 10 and lay them out on your desk. And then get a piece of paper and put numbers 1 through 10. Mm-hmm. And if the first flashcard has like a, a term on it and the back has a definition, then you write out the definition. And if it has a definition, you write out the term. If it has, however you have your flashcard set up, if, you, if it has a muscle name on it, you write out the bone it connects to or however yeah. you have it, right? You give yourself a quiz using those top 10. And then you go back and, oh, and as you're answering, make, add a little check mark or, or a star if you're really confident in your answer mm-hmm. that, that you know it. Then go grade yourself by flip, flipping over the flashcards. So you haven't flipped them over yet. You haven't cheated on your own text. Now <laughs> flip them over, see if you got it right. If you got it right and you were confident in it, put it in a pile far it's away done. from you. I don't need that You're anymore. done. You don't need to don't waste, don't waste time on that. Right. <laughs> if you got it right, but you weren't confident, put that in, a, in another pile. Maybe you'll get back to that, but you knew mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. unless it, you unless you know it was a total guess, you know, put that aside. That's not where you really need to spend your time. Trust yourself. Now you should be confident that you got it. Mm-hmm. The ones that you got wrong, th- those stay close to you. And that's now your new pile. And then you that's what you study. And then you do this again. And then you study. And then you do this again. And so you're slowly moving cards into that confidence, higher confidence, or the correct piles. And your stack of stuff to study gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you can feel like you're learning stuff that way. Um, and, and in fact, there's you can get this in apps and other things. The Crash Course app uh, for anatomy and physiology helps you track your confidence and helps you figure out what you know and you don't know in the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last thing that you wrote down here is to learn by teaching. And this can, I, I, I remember doing this to myself. Yeah. Be like, like, how would I say this to me if I wanted me to learn it? Um, and just like, just restating or writing down in my own words, what I have learned, because that's the real synthesis. Yes. That's how I learn now is teaching myself, yeah. but you know, that takes some practice you really do have to know what you don't know before i think you can teach yourself Mm -hmm. and so that can be difficult um i actually started when i first took comparative anatomy in graduate school out in montana uh i taught my dog it was just someone (laughs) else to talk to but she had big rippling muscles and short fur so when i was learning all the muscles i could like pet her she enjoyed just you know being pet and any attention she could get but i would pet her and name the muscle get a dog yeah, good uh, but but you got to make sure or it's not cat. very shaggy. You need a real, so like, or, or one of those hairless cats. Right, right, <laughs> right. And it, so you can see the muscles. Just, but teach anyone. Teach. Uh, yeah. I, I have I have students that say I don't have anyone to teach my my roommate is an English major. Perfect. Teach them. <laughs> they they'll get this, really bored. The, I'll but tell if you they what. Understand it. You know it. My wife hates this about me, but she knows so many things now. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my wife would say the same thing. I have to tell you about this thing I learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely the best way. Because like you said, it helps you process and reformulate your own ideas so that someone else, even if that someone else is you, can understand it. Yeah. All right. Um, we have a couple of chat questions. I'm going to ask you a chat question. Okay. Um, and I'm curious about this from from Katarina who asks, "What happens when a muscle cramps? What is, uh, why is why am I in pain?" You know, that's a good question. That is not in my wheelhouse. Uh, <laughs> so I can't give you it's a, a definitive muscle. answer. It's I know, muscle, I know, and I actually am a muscle physiologist, but for birds, <laughs> and I they never tell me when their 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 muscle cramps. cramps. <laughs> um, but I, what I will say is, you can think of so I'm not defining what a muscle cramp is, but you can think about all the steps of a muscle contraction and what potentially could go wrong 
if the muscle is cramping and it's actually contracting. Um, mm -hmm. I do teach students about like different kinds of toxins and venoms as a way of, of learning how muscles contract. So you can have things that are kind of going wrong on the nervous system side, either the brain is constantly sending a signal or the neuron is, is firing on its own too much um, or the acetylcholine that's floating across and binding to its channel, there's something wrong with that channel. And so the muscle cells thinks it's constantly being told to contract. Uh, uh, you can also get problems in the muscle itself where you, you can have uh, say too much calcium in the muscle and that's the final signal for the, the actual contraction phase. Uh, you can get electrolyte imbalances, right? You, there's a lot of things that can uh, interfere with that nice clean system of signals that we've talked about that that could potentially cause a muscle cramp but as far as like a cramp during exercise uh, i i definitely don't know enough to don't give a definitive people. answer yeah i was uh i was told once and i please check me on this before you tell someone else people listening that the reason that cramps hurt after a while is because uh there's not enough blood to continue the cramp um to continue the muscle flex um the the effort of it and the cramping can actually constrict blood supply like the, the flexing of the muscle itself can constrict blood supply because the muscle is flexing. Yes, mus muscle contraction in general changes blood flow and can constrict it. And muscles hurt a lot, like during a heart attack, uh, even cardiac muscle hurts a lot when the oxygen uh, delivery rate is too slow for the demand. So if your chest hurts, go to the doctor immediately. Yeah, although importantly, uh, this is surprisingly not well known for women having heart attacks. That pain is not usually uh, it can a be different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's often actually more like fatigue. Yeah, uh, and it can be referred trauma. more often in like the neck or the arms. Yeah, it can show up. Yeah. The pain can show up in different places. Mm -hmm. Stupid bodies. Um, <laughs> William had a question. Do you have any tricks for remembering the the veins and the arteries? You know, I actually do. Uh, it worked for me. I think it works for a lot of my students. Uh, and that's to draw a map. And like I said before, with the bones, start simple. And the best maps aren't, aren't they're not really accurate. They actually mm -hmm. are easier to follow. So think of like a subway map or a transit map where you can see the order of things and you can see the connections, but it's not like it's geographically 100% accurate. Uh, so, so if you draw your map and just start by thinking, I'm giving someone directions to the spleen or to the stomach. Uh, how do I get from the heart down there? And you just learn that part first. Mm. And then you say, well, what if I also wanted to go down to the leg? Then you go to the spleen, you, you, you draw your map to the spleen, so just to refresh your brain, and then you continue, you go past that turn and you go down to the leg and you label it. So again, start with just a few arteries and veins and label them and then build up on that. Every time you redraw it, just add a few more, uh, like adding a few more turns. It's like learning your way around a new city, right? You learn just like one simple path from home to work. And then you start learning the scenic routes around that. Uh, the, once you get that pathway down, then say you're dissecting, you're looking at a, a much more realistic model, it's e much easier to find the actual arteries and veins because you can always go back to the aorta and start mm -hmm. from there, start from where you know, and then follow the arteries and veins out in the dissection. And if you know your map well enough, then you will be able to follow the actual things. Right, and, and also you know where you lose track. Like if you're following a map, you know, like, and and then you reinforce the most common boulevards, the bigger the bigger roads, and so every time you're going down, you're reinforcing that, like yep. the the most important um, and the most common uh, bits before you get to the the branches that are going to be harder to remember because there are so many of them. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of uh, part of spaced repetition, which is the learning strategy of repeating but making sure to space it out over days or weeks or even longer. Uh, this which is really so hard remember. to do because that is not how I am tested or no, was tested. Um, yep. It was like, here, get, get the information and then take the test and then forget it forever. <laughs> Until maybe the final exam. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this is, 
you know, if you're in an anatomy class, sure, you need, you probably need to get a certain grade to continue on in whatever program, but it's probably not the last time you're going to see this stuff. It's and that's big yeah. space repetition. And you yeah. see it maybe first year in college or mm -hmm. community college, and then you might not see it again until four years later. But if you work hard in that first year, There's it'll be there. there. Yeah. It's it'll amazing how, how much stuff is still there. Like I, I recently started yeah. learning Spanish again and I hadn't looked at it since the first, my first year, my freshman year of college. And I was like, wow, there's a fair amount of Spanish still in this brain. Um, so yeah, they're amazing Agreed. organs. Okay. Well, I feel as if I learned some wonderful things about anatomy and physiology. So thank you everybody for asking thoughtful questions. And thanks again to Flipgrid for sponsoring the live stream, making it all happen. Um, and you can check them out. There's a, a link to them in the description below. Brandon, thank you very much for all of your expertise. And I, yeah, I just really appreciate seeing you again. Yeah, and Hank, thank you for Crash Course. I, I know it's helped a lot of my students in lots That's of different great. classes. I think it's been a great resource. Well, thanks so much. And thank you for contributing to it and making anatomy and physiology possible. Thank you all for joining us. I have been Hank Green. That's been Brandon Jackson. Thank you. It's been a good old time.